thank you very much and uh, thank you very much professor D'Amico for inviting me here it's my great pleasure to be here thank you very much for coming uh, so today I will be uh, talking a little bit about piezoelectric resonant MEMS NEMS devices for sensing applications um, so here is the uh, quick outline of my presentation I will start with a little bit of overview of MEMS devices in general uh, then I will talk a little bit about a modeling of a MEMS resonator and after that, I will introduce an example of a particular technology that we have been using to develop different kind of wireless communication devices and also different kind of sensors. And then I will go through a few examples of different sensors that we are uh, de developing using this uh, technology platform. I will talk a little bit about gravimetric sensing, uh, IR and terahertz detectors, and finally also some magnetic field sensors. Okay, so nowadays uh, MEMS device can, you can find MEMS device pretty much everywhere, uh, going from DLP projectors to automotive, but also in cell phones, for example, where piezoelectric microacoustic devices are used uh, to implement relatively low power miniaturized RF front ends. And in fact, if you look uh, at the market of MEMS device, you see that has been growing steadily. And in fact, at 18, you know, approaching 18 billion in uh, uh, 2015. So that's the, the forecast. And if you look at the composition of this market, you see that most of it is occupied uh, by different kind of sensors as well as wireless communication devices. So now, what's the advantage of using MEMS, NEMS-based uh, sensors? Uh, well, I think we could uh, discuss for a long time about that. Uh, from my point of view, the, the main advantage, the key factor of MEMS, NEMS technologies is that they can really de uh, deliver multiple sensing and wireless uh, functionality in the same uh, uh, footprint, in a small footprint, basically, in the same platform. And that really enables uh, new applications in terms of distributed, low power, and high throughput uh, sensing that are not available today. And an example of that is uh, the Internet of Things, in which uh, physical and virtual objects are linked together through the exploitation of these sensing and wireless communication functionalities. And in order to build such highly distributed uh, uh, multifunctional uh, sensing networks, uh, we need uh, uh, wireless sensing nodes that are miniaturized, low power, multifunctional, and reconfigurable. And really, I think in this space, MEMS technologies can play an important and significant role. And this, uh, this has substantially been the division that has inspired the, the research in my, in my group. And in particular, we have been working at the development of a core NEMS resonant uh, technology uh, that can be used, called aluminum nitride nanoplate resonator, and I will talk a little bit about that later, uh, that can be used to, the, to implement multiple sensing and wireless functionalities in a single platform. Uh, so, for example, we are working at the development of reconfigurable RF filters that can be used for uh, wireless radios that basically can operate on multiple wireless communication standards, but we are also building, by combining these piezoelectric uh, resonant devices with other advanced materials, we are developing different kind of sensors, such as gravimetric sensors with ultra low detection capability, but also uncooled IR, infrared and terahertz detectors, and also magnetic field sensors. And I will talk about, uh, I will give you a few examples of these things uh, in the second part of this uh, tutorial. So let me start from the very basics, substantially what is a mechanical resonator. Well, think about the chord of a guitar. Uh, it's a mechanical structure, substantially, that has an intrinsic natural frequency for which uh, the amplitude of vibration is enhanced. So think about the chord of a guitar. You pull the chord of a guitar, you release it, and it starts vibrating at the mechanical natural frequency of, the, of that chord, which is set by the stiffness and the mass uh, of, that, uh, of that chord. A very important parameter for uh, a mechanical resonator is, or for any resonance system in general is the quality factor. So basically, uh, high quality factor means that you have a very sharp resonant fix, so the bandwidth here of this amplitude versus frequency response is very narrow. So we have an intrinsic, extremely stable uh, frequency uh, reference with a high quality factor resonance system. And as I will show you today, uh, micro nanoelectromechanical resonant devices can be used to achieve for example, very high values of quality factors that cannot be achieved with conventional uh, RLC components, for example. Uh, another interesting thing is that how do we couple energy in and out this mechanical structure? Well, with the chord of the guitar, you, use your, you pull it and you release it and you start the vibration. And you know, of course, you hear the sound. That's the way you sense the vibration. 
But in the case of a microelectromechanical structures, we need a mechanism to actuate and sense motion out of these uh, micro nanomechanical structures. And there are different uh, transduction techniques that uh, have been used uh, to, for that uh, in order to accomplish that. And today, uh, I will uh, definitely focus a little bit more on piezoelectric uh, transduction, and I will show you some of the advantages of using this piezoelectric transduction in the MEMS resonant uh, technologies. But I will also give you a little bit of a comparison with some differences with the electrostatic transduction. So another interesting thing about uh, resonant systems is that they can be used to implement uh, very good sensors. And the idea here is that the mechanical resonant frequency of this structure can be made highly sensitive to external perturbations. So substantially, and especially by reducing the dimension of these um, micro-mechanical structures or going in the micro-nano uh, domain, that those devices become extremely sensitive. By scaling the volume, we achieve very high sensitivity. But at the same time, if we can maintain uh, that important parameter, such high quality factors, an intrinsic low noise system, we can really achieve detection capabilities that cannot be uh, achieved with the different technologies, uh, basically combining high sensitivities and low noise performance. And also another very interesting thing about resonant sensor is that the output quantity of a resonant sensor is a frequency, which is a quantity that can be measured with very high level of accuracy. Uh, so that's another important advantage of using resonant sensors. Okay, so now let me uh, move forward and talk a little bit how we model uh, MEMS resonator. Well, let's start from the uh, very beginning. So how do we model a mechanical uh, resonant system? Well, with a lamp, the a uh, spring, mass, and a damper, substantially. So we have a system like this, and we can substantially uh, lump the stiffness, the inertia, and the loss, then uh, the energy loss of the mechanical structure into these components in the mechanical domain. And once we have something like this, we know that the, our resonant frequency of this structure is the square root of k over m, where k is the stiffness, stiffness and m is the mass. So now, a very interesting thing uh, when we talk about electromechanical devices is that all these uh, uh, mechanical variables can be mapped in the electrical domain. Fine, yes, you have a question. Which part is the electrical uh, That's a good question. Uh, I, I think I, we could, uh, yeah, I, I was not, uh, so I didn't know if. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think yeah. very likely we can, I can make it available. Yeah. Okay, uh, so, so the interesting thing is that these uh, mechanical variables can be mapped in the electrical domain. So substantially we can find the equivalence for all these mechanical variables in the electrical domain. So, and, you know, that's simple analogy. Substantially, if you think about force and velocity, it's power, force and velocity is power, voltage time current is also power. Based on that, basically we can find analog, uh, analog electro electronic components that are a good representation of these mechanical quantities. And so, and this is of course very powerful now because uh, well, when we have this model in, mecha in a mechanical domain of a, for example, a very simple uh, mechanical resonant uh, uh, st structure, a spring mass damper system, well, we can represent these in the electrical domain with an equivalent circuit like the one that you see here in figure, where basically the, uh, the spring is uh, represented by a capacitor with capacitance one over k. The mass is represented by an inductance with inductance, well, inductor but with inductance m, and the damper by a resistor with resistance b. So now the interesting thing is that once we have uh, this equivalent circuit, we can use all the uh, circuit uh, analysis technique that we know, and we can achieve, by solving the circuit, we can f achieve basically the same results that we would uh, achieved by simply using Newton's law in this very simple uh, mechanical system. And of course, we can use, for example, complex impedances, all the, and, and think about frequency responses, dynamic analysis of this circuit. So, um, of course, it's a very powerful way to analyze a mechanical system in the electrical domain. So, but now the question is, so if I show you again this circuit here, well, you see that there is a, an equivalent voltage source with equivalent voltage, which is F, so basically the force that you have here. But now, how can we translate from this electrical to mechanical? 
So basically here you're saying, well, if I have a certain force, I can find what's, for example, the displacement of this structure, and you can do that with the equivalent circuit. But how can we translate from electrical to mechanical domain? Well, in order to do that, we need an additional component, which is that transducer. I remember at the very beginning of this lecture, I mentioned that somehow we need to actuate and sense motion out of this micro nanomechanical structure. Well, how do we represent that in the electrical domain? Well, using something like this. So in this particular representation, you have this uh, transducer. Uh, basically, it's used to convert mechanical into electrical variables, and vice versa. So, and in here it's represented with this, uh, uh, basically, capacitor, which is the, capa the electrical capacitance of the transducer, and this transformer with transforming ratio eta, which substantially is a quantity that relates force to voltage and charge to velocity, as you can see here. So basically, what we need to do uh, in order to model an electromechanical resonator, once we have all these uh, uh, parameters, that, as I show you, it's quite easy to, uh, to find uh, uh, correspondence with the mechanical domain, well, basically, what we need to understand is what is that eta. And that really depends on the transduction mechanism that we use. And as I mentioned earlier, there are different kind of uh, transduction mechanisms that can be used in the micro and nano domain, and you know, electrostatic, piezoelectric, electrostrictive, uh, thermal, several like that. And again, today I will definitely uh, talk a little bit more about piezoelectric, and I will show you how we can derive this eta for a piezoelectric transducer. Okay, so let me. I'm not going to go into the details of piezoelectricity, but just you know some basic uh, concepts. Um, so of course the word comes from mm, uh, Greek piezo, which means to press. Substantially, this is a material property which uh, uh, allows to convert mechanical pressure into an electric, uh, in electric field and vice versa. And this really has to do with the crystal structure of the particular material that we are uh, considering. Uh, substantially, what happens is that if you squeeze the, cri the crystal. Uh, the charges becomes out of balance, and by doing that, we generate a posi net positive or negative charges at the opposite phase of the material. So substantially, we have something like that uh, when the material is uh, not uh, is not squeezed or uh, stretched. Substantially, there is no charge, but then if you stretch it or compress it, there will be an electric field across the material. And how do we describe that? Well, uh, there are constitutive equations for piezoelectric materials. And as you can see here, uh, we have the, the conventional relation between strain and stress in a material. In a piezoelectric material, we have an additional term which basically relates the electric field to the strain through this piezoelectric charge coefficient. And of course, there is also this reverse uh, thing. Basically, we have that the electric displacement, of course, is related to the electric field, to the dielectric permittivity. But also, in a piezoelectric material, uh, if we have a the, we have that the electric displacement is also related to the stress, again, through this piezoelectric coefficient. So typically, uh, piezoelectric materials are uh, anisotropic. So basically, all these uh, uh, piezoelectric uh, coefficients are you know, in a form of a matrix. So substantially, a different piezoelectric coefficient depending on the different directions. Uh, but you know, to give you an example, most of the materials, piezoelectric materials that are used in the MEMS, NEMS domain, typically use these coefficients that are like the D31, D33, and D15. And just to give you an idea of what I mean with that, uh, substantially what, for example, is D31, well, the idea is that if you apply an electric field uh, in the three directions, so think about the thickness of uh, an aluminum nitride layer, well, you can get a longitudinal strain due to this D31 equivalent uh, piezoelectric coefficient of the aluminum nitride. So, electric field along the three direction, you can get a longitudinal strain. So here, just you know, to show you what's the uh, general analytical formulation of these uh, uh, piezoelectric uh, uh, equations, basically um, constitutive equations, and uh, an, an important, as I mentioned, again, they have, these piezoelectric coefficients are in forms of matrices, substantially, three, three by six arrays. Uh, we can convert from this E coefficient that you see here to the D coefficient that well, I showed you earlier using these relations. So that's an interesting and important factor. But you know, typically these uh, uh, complex uh, matrices are simplified based on the particular material that you're using. So by taking advantage of crystal symmetries, for a given crystal structure, the matrix gets significantly simplified. And here I'm just giving an example, of course. Uh, so this is the, for this particular crystal structure, which is 
the case, for example, of aluminum nitride, which I will uh, discuss a little bit more later. So in that case, basically you see that the matrix is simplified, and again, the important coefficients that you get as this D31, which basically give you extensional longitudinal stra uh, strength uh, for an electric field applied along the Z direction, where Z direction typically is the thickness where you uh, deposit or grow this material. Um, or, so basically you can have, uh, apply electric field along the, this direction and you get displacement in this direction, or apply electric field this direction and you get displacement along the thickness. There are, of course, also shear strain generated due to the, these other piezoelectric coefficients. Uh, of course, typically, the, the, the re why you know, some of these values are relatively small and often are not used because it also depends on the way you can apply physically the electric field to the piezoelectric material itself. <clears throat> okay, so now, how can we build a piezoelectric resonator? Well, let me start giving, you know, looking at this example here. So let's think about this longitudinal bar resonator. So we are, you know, think about this structure is uh, anchored here and here, and this part is suspended substantially, so it's free to move. And basically this structure expand and contract like this in plane. So how would we model this structure? And again, this could be made out of piezoelectric material on top of a structure layer, which could be silicon, for example, or it could be made out of a only piezoelectric material. So, now, how do we model this? Well, the first thing that we need to do, of course, we find the wave equation here for this structure, and by applying the proper boundary conditions, the first thing that we need to do, is we find what are directional modes. So basically, what's the mode shape of vibration of this structure? And you know, if you take this, you apply the right boundary conditions, you solve the differential equation, you find that basically these are directional modes. And again, uh, given those uh, boundary conditions, you can find what are the resonant frequencies of this particular structure. And as you can see, they in this particular ca case for a, for a longitudinal bar, uh, you can see that you see this, uh, the direction of frequency is inversely proportional to the length of the bar, and of course, it depends also on some of the material properties like Young's modulus and density. Well, remember our objective is to find something like this, then find something like that, and eventually, you know, find the uh, transduction coefficient, the, the find that eta, basically, that will give us the complete circuit that we can use for our an analysis. So in order to do that, of course, after we find the mode shape of vibration, the resonant frequencies, what we need to find is what is the equivalent mass, what is the equivalent stiffness, and what is the equivalent damping. Well, so what's the equivalent mass of this uh, longitudinal bar resonator? Uh, well, here, the interesting thing is that you have to consider the fact that the displacement along this bar is not uniform. So we have to take that into account when you compute the mass of the resonator. So basically the idea is that some parts of this device, and you can think for example here in the center when it, when it, it is anchored, they do not move, they do not displace. So they will not contribute to the mass of the resonator in the same way, the model mass of the resonator. So if you do that, if you take into account this mode shape of vibration, uh, and you compute basically a lamp mass at, an, at a specific point of the resonator, you find out that that effective mass is, is equal to half the mass of the entire structure. So basically what we do, we are simply lumping the mass of the device at a specific point, and typically you select the point of maximum displacement. So once you have the mass, you have the resonant frequency, of course you can find the equivalent uh, spring constant, the effective stif stiffness, and again, all these quantities, they both depend on geometrical parameters as well as material properties. And of course, when you have mass, uh, frequency, well, the damping will be uh, inversely proportional to the quality factor of the resonance system. So now we have all these different parameters for our uh, resonance structure, so we can build this circuit. Now, really, the next step is that we need to find out, you remember, that eta, which was the, that parameter that relates uh, voltage um, to force and charge to displacement substantially, right? So, and how do we do that? Well, you know, let's look at the transduction mechanism that we are using. And again, so we can take these, uh, the piezoelectric uh, uh, equations, and we can model this piezoelectric effect as a lamp force placed at the actuator edges, right? So what's the, so the stress in this case is the force divided by the cross-sectional area of this bar, and that is equal to E31 times the electric field, so voltage divided by the thickness of the bar, 
and you can express E31 as function of, uh, um, you can convert that E31 in D31 using the Young's modulus substantially. Well, basically what you see here is that we have that the force is equal to the Young's modulus, the piezoelectric coefficient the, times the width times the voltage that you're applying across the piezoelectric material. So now again, uh, one thing that we have to take into account is that, so where are we applying the force here? So in this example, you see that these electrodes basically cover only a portion of this bar. Well, we, again, somehow since the mode of vibration, as I showed you before, as, uh, is not uniform along the bar, we have to take that into account. And basically the idea is that if the electrode covers the entire structure, basically so it covers the entire displacement that has this shape, substantially, well, what we have that the effective force is gonna be equal to two times that force that I showed you earlier. So basically, in the case we have the entire beam is covered, the total force is gonna be equal to two times this quantity. But of course, if the coverage is smaller than that, well, then the effective force will have to take into account these parameters, but basically take into account the fact that we are not covering the areas uh, of maximum displacement for the bar. So, but beyond that, you know, the interesting thing, you know, basically the, the, what we did here is that we have simply applied the constitutive equation of piezoelectric material, and we found what is the relation between force and voltage, substantially. So that's the, the very basic idea. Again, the only trick, the only small thing that we have to be careful is that we need to always to take into account what is the mode shape of vibration of the bar. But finally, I mean, we found what is eta, substantially, for the, actua for the actuation mechanism, right? So now we know how force and voltage are related. So we found our eta. But now the question is, what about sensing? So basically now I show you how we can relate force to voltage. So how we can actually actuate motion in this piezoelectric bar. But how can we sense the vibration, the displacement of this piezoelectric bar? Well, again, that's relatively simple. You take the, this equation for the piezoelectric bar as an either. You integrate along the length of that bar you do some very simple and trivial math, and you find uh, math, sorry, and you find that uh, the actually you have a current which is equal to capacitance times derivative of voltage, which is basically substantial electrical contribution of the transducer, right? So remember that in the electrical domain here we actually have a capacitor, right? So we have a piezoelectric material, an electrode on top, another electrode on bottom, so we have a parallel plate capacitor, which will give you that contribution to the sensing current substantially. But then, of course, we have again another term which is eta times the, uh, the velocity substantially, right? And in fact, again, we found another term which related charge to the displacement, eta, and you can see here by simply, you know, again, taking this equation and integrating along the length, nothing different. And you exactly find the same result, so basically that Fort, you know, charge and displacement are related by this quantity, which is our eta, our transduction um, coefficient. So basically now we found eta for both actuation and sensing mechanism, and we can really now at this point build our equivalent electrical circuit. So in the mechanical domain, of course, we have this equation. In the electrical domain, we have the simple equation of an RLC circuit. But now we know how to relate force to voltage and in general, charge to, you know, uh, charge to displacement. So now that we have that, we can manipulate these equations and we can find this expression which basically gives you um, the equation of an RLC circuit in the electrical domain in which all the value of the different components, inductance, capacitance, and resistance depend on some mechanical parameters as well as the transduction coefficient. So basically, we found this equivalent circuit. So probably now you're looking at, well, but earlier you showed that you had, a trans um, you had a transformer in the equivalent electrical circuit. Well, basically what we did is that we eliminated that transformer using a simple uh, impedance transformation of the transformer itself. But as you can see here, the, the, it's, it's extremely simple to derive that. It's basically it's just taking into account that we have the value of eta now. So we can directly relate force to voltage and we can find these values for all these different motional uh, components of the equivalent circuit. 
So here is our equivalent electrical circuit, so we know eta. So, and again, the very important thing is that this eta really depends on the particular transduction mechanism that we are using. So in our case, now we're using this piezoelectric transduction. So for a longitudinal piezoelectric bar resonator, that is the value of eta that you get. For example, if you use an electrostatic transduction mechanism to actuate the same bar, so let's say you make that bar made out of silicon, and you want to use an electrostatic transduction mechanism, well, these eta, of course, will change. And that's what I'm going to show you later. But in general, we, these expressions, they are valid, in general, for any electromechanical resonator. Uh, so we have that the inductance, again, depends on the effective mass of the resonator, which, again, is the mass of the resonator taking into account the mode shape of vibration of the structure, so it's the model mass, and the same thing for the equivalent uh, stiffness. So now, how do we find the values of all these different components? Well, it, we just plug in the values that we found before, right? We derive what is the effective mass, and we found what is eta, so we can directly find the value of the emotional inductance. So as you can see, this all depends on geometrical parameters and uh, material properties. So basically, if we know these uh, material properties, we can design the piezoelectric bar resonator in order to achieve a certain value of motion impedance, for example, motion capacitance and motion inductance. And of course, what is this C0? Well, again, one more time, this is the actual electrical capacitance of the piezoelectric transducer. So it's the parallel plate capacitor composed of a top electrode, piezoelectric layer, and bottom electrode. And finally, of course, the, uh, the resonant frequency of this piezoelectric uh, bar resonator is inversely, pro inversely proportional to uh, the length of the bar. Okay, so this is uh, our circuit model. Uh, now, what I wanna introduce is a very important parameter uh, that sometimes is neglected, in the, especially in, in, in when we talk about micro and nanoelectromechanical devices. This important parameter is this uh, electromechanical coupling coefficient, kT squared. So this kT square uh, is defined as this Young, the Young's modulus times the piezoelectric coefficient divided by the uh, epsilon, so times permittivity. So, but now if you take this quantity and you plug it in the expression of CM that I just showed you earlier, so that we just derived basically, you see that this kT square, basically it's proportional to the ratio between CM and C0. So proportional to the um, ratio between the motional capacitance and the electrical capacitance of the resonator. And if you look at that, basically you see that that ratio uh, is pretty much the ratio of the mechanical energy over electrical energy. So basically this electromechanical coupling coefficient uh, represents um, the, how much energy is transferred from the electrical to the mechanical. So it's an extremely important parameter which basically tells you how efficient is the transduction mechanism that you are using. So, but what's the implication of that? What's the effect, for example, on, on the equivalent electrical impedance of the electromechanical resonator that you are building? Well, now if you use that KT square, you can rewrite all those LM, CM, and RM, all those motional components, and you actually find out that they're all function of these KT square, C0, and quality factor. And in particular, you see that the motional impedance Rm, right, of this simple RLC circuit is inversely proportional to this kT squared Q product, which is really the, probably the most important figure of merit for an electromechanical resonator for different kind of application. Before I move forward, just let me, I didn't mention what is this RS. Well, this basically typically is introduced in the model just to lump the loss in the electrical lines that you use for routing, for example, has nothing to do with you know, the mechanical part of the electromechanical device. So, but again, the, the important thing here, the message they want uh, to deliver is that there is, you know, quality factor is absolutely an important parameter for an electromechanical resonator. Uh, of course, basically it's the loss that you have in the system, but also together with the quality factor, this electromechanical coupling coefficient is a very important parameter because really sets what is the motional impedance, the equivalent electrical impedance of, of, of the electromechanical resonator. So in fact, this figure of merit is extremely important because, for example, it sets, as I, as I mentioned, the motional resistance of any resonator, but also has effect, for example, in the wireless communication devices, when you, if you think about building a filter using these resonant electromechanical devices, that directly affect, affect, affect insertion loss and bandwidth of the filter. 
But also in general, when you build an oscillator <coughs> based on an electromechanical resonant device, that KT square Q has effect on the phase noise and the power consumption of the oscillator. So even when we build sensors, this electromechanical coupling coefficient has an important role. Because basically, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, I said, well, you know, resonators are pretty good sensors. If we make them very small, maintaining high quality factor, we get very high sensitivity and also low noise performance, which is great to build sensors. But another thing that we have to take into account, we, by making them small, we still need to be able to effectively couple energy in and out of the mechanical structure in order to build a real system. And so we definitely always need to look at these KT square Q products for the resonator. Okay, so as I promised, uh, I mean, I've been talking about piezoelectric transduction and you know, I'm not gonna go into the details of the electro electrostatic transduction instead, but I just wanna give you an idea of what are the main differences between electrostatic and piezoelectric since, of course, those are the two main transduction mechanisms that have been used in the MEMS, NEMS domain. So, of course, in an electrostatic case, and here you see just an example of an electrostatic resonator from Clark Ewing Group at UC Berkeley, in an electrostatic resonator, uh, we use air gap to produce electrostatic forces. Um, so the, the idea there is that if we can place those, those electrodes very close, so reduce that gap uh, very close to the electromechanical resonator. So in this case, instead of a bar, you have a disc. I will show you later an example with a bar. But you know, pretty much the concept is the same. You place those um, electrodes in a location where you maximize substantially the, the, the coupling. Um, so, but then what's the difference with, so the question is, okay, you can build exactly the same thing, right? You have the resonator, you can build the same equivalent electrical circuit. What are gonna be, what are going to be the differences compared to the piezoelectric case? Well, let's look at this. So here is the piezoelectric longitudinal bar resonator that we've been discussing and we find out what is the KT square, right? And as I show you, the KT square in the case of the piezoelectric material is just determined, is simply determined by the material properties. That's an intrinsic property of the material. And typically that KT square has values of 2% to 3% for this longitudinal bar resonator. Again, remember that for a piezoelectric material, this depends on the piezoelectric coefficient that you're using. So if you're using, exploiting, for example, the D3 tree, like, uh, like for example, happens in uh, thin, thin bulk acoustic uh, F-bar devices, for example, then here you will have a D3 tree. So basically you will have a bar that vibrates along the thickness. That value is gonna be even larger. What about the electrostatic case? Well, in the electrostatic case, if you compute, so you go the same procedure that I did for the piezoelectric bar resonator, but instead of using the piezoelectric force, use the electrostatic force to derive all those equations, and you find the value of eta, and then you, know, you can look back and look at the ratio between CM and C0, well, you find out that in that case, the KT square is directly proportional to the square of the DC voltage that you need to apply for the electrostatic force. So you, you always need to apply a DC bias in order to get electrostatic force, and inversely proportional to the cube of the gap. So that's, of course, is a, you know, the research is going in the direction, okay, let's try to reduce the gap as more as possible so that we can increase the electromechanical coupling coefficient. But the most important, the main message here is that the value of KT squared that you get for the electrostatic transduction is typically a lot smaller than in the case of the piezoelectric. So the piezoelectric transduction mechanism intrinsically has the advantage of being a, a very eff efficient transduction mechanism. Yes? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Change, yes. Yes, so basically the idea, yes. Yes, basically, so that's a, that's a very good point. I mean, the idea is that it's a linearized model substantially. So you're basically operating, uh, so all these analysis, basically you're operating at a certain operating point. So for a certain BDC, basically, which gives you a certain gap, and then, you are considering small variations about that operating point. So that is, that's why you get, you get that. <clears throat> okay, so in general, uh, if we compare uh, 
piezoelectric and electrostatic, you know, of course, I, I think I stressed out the, the important uh, advantage of piezoelectric compared to electrostatic in terms of efficient piezoelectric transduction mechanism, which really gives you uh, this uh, large coupling, but also low electrical impedance, which is very important. And in terms of quality factors, I will show you later, um, piezoelectric micro nanomechanical resonant devices nowadays can reach quality factor in air approaching 5,000. So it's a pretty decent quality factor. But still, um, the disadvantage of piezoelectric compared to electrostatic is that typically electrostatic devices are based on single crystal silicon material, which is intrinsically a very low acoustic loss material. So with electrostatic devices, you typically can get quality factors that are much higher than what you typically achieve with piezoelectric material. But again, that's an open uh, you know, field of research. Uh, try to understand what are all the uh, sources of uh, Q degradation in electromechanical resonators. Um, the other interesting thing, uh, you know, the electrostatic transduction mechanism allows you to, to, to achieve tuning, tuning substantially. So the electrostatic transduction is a nonlinear transduction mechanism, and that allows you to tune the frequency of the device, basically, uh, by taking advantage of that. Those are things that you cannot do with piezoelectric devices. So one of the issues that you have with piezoelectric high quality factor microacoustic resonators is that the operating frequency of the device cannot be very, uh, cannot be tuned easily by applying, for example, a, a DC bias. Okay, so I talked about piezoelectric transduction, piezoelectric materials, so, but what are the piezoelectric materials that we typically use in the MEMS NEMS domain? Well, I'm showing quartz here because it's not the mostly, you know, the material that's uh, widely used in the MEMS domain, but of course, is the material that has been uh, used a lot, for example, in electromechanical resonators, think about quartz crystal resonators that are widely used for many different kind of uh, applications going from frequency sources to different kind of sensors. So quartz, of course, is a, you know, a very high quality factor material, so excellent from that point of view, but it's a bulk material. So we, it, it's really, it, it's not possible to produce a thin film piezoelectric quartz material. So what people have done is that they try to, starting from a bulk you know, quartz substrate, they try to thin it down in order to build this micro nano electromechanical structure. And of course, it's a very interesting approach which has produced very interesting results, excellent uh, resonators with excellent performances. I mean, of course, the, the main challenge that you get there is that the fabrication process is quite challenging because you really need to start from a bulk material, thin it down. So in terms of large scale fabrication, there are some challenges, but some work has been done in that area. On the other side, material that uh, has attracted a lot of attention uh, in the past, I would say 10 years or so, is this uh, thin film aluminum nitride. Uh, so the, the main advantage of this uh, thin film aluminum nitride is that it can be deposited by a relatively low temperature sputtering process. So it's post-CMOS compatible, and you can produce a, a very uh, you know, a thin film aluminum nitride on a silicon substrate with a very high quality uh, piezoelectric coefficients. And that, that several groups, and these are just examples that have been looking at that for many different kinds of applications, building different kinds of uh, resonant devices, filters, and sensors. Um, so, and again, what, you know, what's the quality factor? You know, as I showed you earlier, typically you can get F time Q product approaching uh, 10 to 12, something like that. So again, it's pretty decent, pretty high. And uh, you maintain the advantage of efficient piezoelectric transduction mechanism. So basically, with this material, you can build miniaturized devices that have, still have pretty uh, low loss mechanism, so high quality factor, but also high transduction efficiency. So you can really think about building either very high frequency resonant devices for wireless communication applications, but also miniaturize small volume sensors with high quality factor and intrinsic efficient transduction mechanism. And in fact, people have demonstrated aluminum nitride films as thin as 10 nanometers with good piezoelectric performance. So for example, these are be being used to build uh, uh, nano actuators, for example, using just a 10 nanometer aluminum nitride film. So that really opens up uh, large, uh, different kind of application. Okay, so now um, let me talk a little bit about a particular kind of piezoelectric resonator. And this is a aluminum nitride nanoplate resonator, and I will explain a little bit more why I call it nanoplate. So what's the basic idea? Well, it's pretty much the same thing that I showed you earlier of the longitudinal bar resonator. So in this case, we have an aluminum nitride layer sandwiched between two metal electrodes. 
when you apply an electric field across the thickness, you get this uh, contour extensional mode of vibration due to the D31 equivalent piezoelectric coefficient of the aluminum nitride. So again, we apply an electric field in this direction, we get displacement in this direction. And as I showed you earlier, so this is exactly the same thing of the longitudinal bars and either, the only variation is that now we are looking at the resonance here along the width rather than along the length of the device. But all the parameters that I showed you earlier are pretty much the same, you just need to invert some of these uh, you know, LBW substantially. So again, what you see is that the operating frequency of the device is set by the width, so by the, it can be lithographically set. So think about, you can build these devices on a, on a wafer, and you, on the same wafer, you can define multiple frequencies on the same side. So that's a, a lot of advantages, for example, for wireless communication RF devices, but I will show you later also for sensing. And what, what the other two geometrical dimensions instead substantially can be set it can be used to set the equivalent electrical impedance of the device, as we discussed earlier. So now, another interesting thing is that by properly patterning the top and the bottom electrode of the device, so I think this is the aluminum nitride plate that I showed you earlier, well, if you use this interdigital configuration on top and on bottom of the structure, you can excite a higher mode of vibration of that plate substantially, okay? So you can induce a strain in this direction, uh, electric field in this direction here, so you have extension here, opposite direction here, so you have compression, so because you excite a higher mode of vibration of this plate. And you can do that either by building these uh, uh, interdigital electrodes on top and on bottom with opposite polarity, but you also can use this uh, lateral field excitation scheme where basically the, electric, the excitation electric field is provided by the top interdigital electrode, while the bottom is a simple electrically floating metal plate, which only acts to confine the electric field across that very thin uh, piezoelectric layer. So that, of course, will have an effect on the equivalent capacitance of the device and also on the equivalent electromechanical coupling coefficient. But of course, um, for example, in this case, you do not need to electrically access this bottom electrode, so the fabrication process it's a little bit simpler for, for, this, uh, for this kind of structure. And I'm just showing you both because often I, you know, I, we use both of these, these, these configurations and I want, just wanted to make sure that um, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so how do we fabricate these devices? Well, so let me start with that. Uh, so we typically we start with a high resistivity silicon substrate. And on top of that, we deposit a bottom electrode, deposit and pattern. For example, often we use platinum, and uh, we deposit platinum and we, uh, we pattern it using a lift-off process. Then on top of that, we deposit, by patterning the position, the thin film aluminum nitride, as you can see here. Then we open BS to access the bottom electrode when we use that thickness field excitation scheme. And and typically we do that in using a wet phosphoric acid etch. After that, we need to define the shape of that plate, right? And we do that using dry etch, typically is in an ICP using chlorine-based uh, chemistry. And the idea here is that why don't you do wet etch? Well, you, you really wanna make sure you, can, you have a certain control of the side modes, the profile of that resonance structure. So you wanna have a good control over the side walls of the plate. <laughs> And that you can really, you can try to do that using a dry edge process. Uh, then, of course, we pattern uh, the top electrode. And again, we use different materials depending on different applications. Often we use aluminum, we use gold also. And it can be patterned again using a lift off process, for example, but also etching could work. So finally, uh, you need to release the device from the silicon substrate. And we do that using a xenon difluoride dry release uh, process. Uh, so basically, it's a very selective etching of silicon. It's a very high isotro isotropic etching of silicon, so we can remove the silicon underneath the structure, which is suspended and anchored to, using uh, two anchors substantially. And here you see an SEM uh, picture of one of the, uh, this actually the highest frequency device that we were able to build. So these are 9.9 .9 gigahertz resonators. So you see this is the nanoplate, the aluminum nitride nanoplate is only 250 nanometer thick. Uh, it's completely released from the silicon substrate and it is anchored to the substrate using these two tiny anchors, substantially. And then what we do is that we define these nano fissures in the top electrode of the device 
so to excite a higher mode of vibration, right? And we were able to do that and achieve operating frequency up to 9.9 meters. Okay, so this looks nice, but what about the performance? Well, here I'm showing you the performance of um, one of the best devices that we were able uh, to fabricate in that frequency range. Well, what is extremely interesting uh, for us, especially, you know, was interesting in the, in the MEMS community, is that despite the reduced volume and the high operating frequency, we were able to maintain a relatively large uh, KT squared Q product. So you see the electromechanical carbon coefficient is the order on 0.8%, and here, the only reason why it's, uh, it's like that is because we are using only one electrode. So only top electrode, we don't have bottom electrode. Quality factor, despite the very high operating frequency of eight gigahertz, it's, it's the order of 700, which is a pretty decent quality factor, and that translates in an equivalent impedance of only 70 ohm. So as you can see, basically what I'm plotting here is the equivalent electrical admittance of the device. So that's the measured response of the electromechanical device, which of course looks like the admittance of an RLC circuit. And here the, uh, the blue dot line is basically the equivalent fitting used using that circuit that I showed you earlier. So the, the very interesting thing here is that we were really able to achieve high frequency and high transduction efficiency in this extremely small volume device. And that, of course, uh, it's extremely interesting for different kind of applications. Okay, but so now if I have to summarize and say, okay, how do we compare this uh, piezoelectric nanofluid resonator technology with other existing resonator technologies? Well, you know, really, I think it has some unique advantages in terms that uh, it's the only device that can go combine IC integration capability. So again, it's a relatively, it's a low temperature sputtering process, POSIMOS compatible, um, but also, uh, it can get, you can get uh, interface to 50 ohm electronics, so very similar to what you can get with F-bar device or quartz, uh, bulky uh, quartz electromechanical resonators, you can get low values of motion impedance, which means that you can directly interface uh, these devices with relatively compact and low power electronics. But also very similar to what you get with surface acoustic wave devices, you can define multiple frequencies on the same subject, which is something that instead you cannot do to a certain extent using uh, resonators with operating frequencies set by the thickness rather than the lateral dimension. And if you compare to other nano electromechanical devices, you see that you still can achieve a pretty large scaling of the device, so a very small volume, but you can achieve larger electromechanic transduction. And for example, you know, differently from nano other nanomechanical resonators, uh, you, you can use a simple on-ship transduction mechanism instead of optical uh, readouts, for example. All right, so now let me move forward and let me talk a little bit about how we use these uh, uh, devices for, in order to build uh, uh, sensors. So let me start talking a little bit about gravimetric sensors. Well, you know, of course, the idea here is that if we load the device with certain mass, the resonant frequency of the device will change, and by tracking that frequency, we can detect the amount of mass. So, but now, if we want to design a high-performance resonance sensor, uh, mass sensors, or you know, uh, gravimetric sensors, well, the most important quantity that we need to consider is this limit of detection. So, basically, what's the minimum amount of mass that we will be able to detect? And that, of course, is directly proportional to the noise-induced frequency fluctuation, and inversely proportional to the mass sensitivity or the sensitivity to mass per unit area of this micromechanical structure. Well, of course, there are several sources of noises, but if we wanna just look at you know, the ultimate limit of this device, we can think about the thermomechanical noise induced frequency fluctuation, which is really something that we cannot eliminate and it will always be there in our sensor. In our, yeah, in our sensor. So, well, if you look at these two equations, you combine them together, you see that this limit of detection is directly proportional to the mass density and thickness of these piezoelectric resonators and inversely proportional to its quality factor. So in order to build the best resonant transducer for you know, mass detection, what you really want to do is to build a resonator with an ultra low density, ultra thin, with high quality factor. So that's the challenge substantially. That's our objective, that's what we wanted to do. And that's why we are stressing a lot the idea of using a nanoplate, right? Because we really believe that if we can scale thickness, density, volume of the resonator 
maintaining a relatively high quality factor and ele uh, efficient uh, high electromechanical coupling coefficient, we can really build excellent uh, mass transducers. So, and that's what we did over the years. And yeah, I'm just giving you some examples of the things that we were able to do. Uh, so we built, for example, these 250 nanometer aluminum nitride nanoplate resonators. We built relatively small arrays for quick demonstration. And we, you know, taking advantage of the excellent transduction efficiency of these devices and the relatively high quality factor, we were able to directly connect uh, this array to a simple uh, multiplex CMOS oscillator built in a 0.5 micron CMOS process. So you can see a very compact uh, sensor array and readout. So relatively very low power, uh, sub milliwatt power consumption. And then what we did, of course, uh, we use uh, different kind of functionalization techniques. Uh, here you see an example, we use single strand DNA sequences um, to functionalize the gold electrode of the device. And we test these devices for different concentration of different gases. Here you see the response for a DNT, uh, for a simulant for the explosive TNT. And Again, taking advantage of the good performance, electromechanical performance of the device, the increased affinity due to this DNA um, um, sensing layer substantially, we were able to achieve uh, concentration in the order, even sub, sub PPB detection limit for this kind of uh, sensor array. So this is very interesting, but then we ask ourselves, okay, can we push it forward? Can we scale down this technology? Can we really build, a, you know, what's the limit? So then what we did is, okay, let's try to design, you know, a 50 nanometer thick aluminum nitride nanoplate resonator, and that's what we did. So as you can see here, we had to go to work a little bit on the design of the structure. Uh, you see the anchor here in this case are much larger than the case I showed you earlier. Then we really had to do that uh, in order to uh, work around issues with stress and stress gradient in such thin aluminum nitride film. But you know, we succeeded and we built a pretty high quality aluminum nitride nanoplate resonator. So these are only a 50 nanometer thick membrane. I'm not sure if you can read well that here, but it's a 50 nanometer aluminum nitride piezoelectric material. And again, we, ex we patterned the top electrode. And as you can see here, again, pre pretty decent electromechanical performance, relatively uh, low uh, uh, motional impedance. So that was exciting, but then if you look at the mass of this device, you see that 83% of the mass of this resonator comes from the metal electrode. So as you can see here, here we have a 25 nanometer of bottom electrode and uh, I think 25 nanometers top electrode. So in terms of advantages in, uh, for sensing, for mass detection, it's limited because the, the mass of the device itself, the density is still pretty la large. So basically the resonator is almost completely made out of metal. So we really are, the, the metal loading limits the scaling and the performance of these devices. And also there's been a lot of research recently showing that for devices operating above, uh, let's say 400 megahertz, the electro damping, so the interface strain between the metal and the piezoelectric material seems to be one of the most important causes of Q degradation in these uh, piezoelectric resonators. So really we have this issue of mass loading in this um, piezoelectric NEMS devices. So the way we are trying to uh, approach uh, to solve this problem is by using graphene electrodes rather than conventional metal electrodes. And the idea here is that, of course, graphene uh, has a very high electrical conductivity being a single monatomic, uh, single atomic layer, uh, a single atomic layer. So people have reported values of sheet resistance in the order of 60 ohm per square for a single atomic layer graphene, which is really impressive, something that you cannot really achieve with any kind of metal. Of course, it's extremely low mass, it's only one atomic layer. And the other, uh, so really can enable ultimate scaling in terms of uh, thickness and mass density. But also the interesting thing here is that graphene is sort of floating right on top of the piezoelectric material, right? It's attached there by using uh, uh, weak Van der Waals uh, forces, right? So it's very different compared to a conventional metal layer deposited uh, by sputtering or evaporation process on top of the piezoelectric material. So what we, we, we think, uh, what we think would be extremely interesting is that graphene, by using graphene electrode, <coughs> so substantially having this sort of floating uh, electrode on top of the device, we could substantially reduce the interface strain and improve the quality factor of the electromechanical resonator. 
So that's what we have been doing. And well, of course, why, what's the idea is that, well, if you can achieve all those goals that I told you, so basically we can reduce the thickness, reduce the density, improve the quality factor, we can really achieve performance that would be order of magnitude better compared to other technologies. But so the first thing that we try to do is that let's try to see what's the effect of using a graphene electron on the operating frequency of the device. So and here, what you, can see, what you see here, these are uh, finite element simulations using console of the operating frequency of these devices for different uh, uh, pitches, so different, uh, yeah, the pitch of the bottom electrode, which is substantially the frequency setting dimension. So here I'm plotting one over the pitch. So large number means higher frequency. And so what we did is that, okay, let's look in this case where we have a conventional structure, so using that lateral field excitation scheme I showed you earlier. So we have an IDT on the bottom, we have a, a gold uh, metal layer on top, and then what would be the operating frequency for a given pitch if we start scaling the thickness of the gold layer? So if we go from 100 nanometers to 50 nanometer, and obviously, you know, for a given pitch, the frequency gets higher because we are reducing the mass of the device. But now, what if completely we remove this metal layer from the simulation and we substitute that with a conductive boundary? So just a simple conductive boundary, so no metal. Well, of course, you see that we have the maximum possible frequency that you can get for this mechanical structure with this uh, frequency setting dimension. But then, of course, if you remove also the bottom electrode, so you use only conductive boundary in the simulation, you really see what's the limit, substantially. So for a given electric field distribution across this structure, what's the maximum operating frequency? What's the maximum sound velocity that you can achieve by simply using aluminum nitride? And that's what you see. So those are the simulations that we did. And you see that, of course, there is a significant variation going from, uh, from here to there. So based on that, uh, we fabricated, the, so based on the fact that especially, you know, by simply removing the top electrode, we have already a significant advantage in terms of mass reduction and uh, frequency enhancement. So what we did, we fabricated uh, these uh, first graphene aluminum nitride resonators. So basically what we did, we completely removed the top electrode of the device and we replaced it with this graphene electrode as you can see here. So in, the, in this SCM picture, this interdigital electrode is on the bottom of the device, and on top, we have an electrically floating graphene uh, electrode. Electrically floating, but also mechanically floating on top of the structure substantially. And in fact, you can see here the optical uh, microscope, of, uh, the optical picture of, of this device. Okay, so here are the measured performance, the device with gold electrode, the device with graphene electrode, you know, clearly you see that, of course, the operating frequency is much higher. And also for this particular device, we measured the improved quality factor, uh, which is a, a pretty interesting thing, right? Because here we are showing that by scaling thickness, volume, and increasing the operating frequency, we get even better electromechanical performance. So that was very encouraging, so we're really going in the right direction. Uh, so we really, that's what we need for a lot of sensing applications. But of course, that was pretty much one device. So what we did is that we, we try to, we develop a pretty reliable fabrication process. Um, and as you can see here, wh what we are, which basically involves graphene transfer on the aluminum nitride uh, chip, substantially. And you know, going through several iterations, we were able to find the right recipes, substantially. And what I'm showing you here is how we compare the graphene chip with a conventional aluminum nitride chip in terms of yield, or what we can do in our, uh, university lab, and you can see that for a conventional, let's say, aluminum nitride resonant device, we get a yield of about 95% based on three uh, reference chips that we fabricated, and we compare that with three graphene chips that we fabricated, and in that case, we have a yield of 90%. So basically, it's a pretty reliable uh, fabrication process, so it can actually work. And you know, thanks to that, we were able to build several devices and do some statistical uh, analysis. And first thing we try to look at is that, of course, let's see what's the advantage that we get, you know, in terms of operating frequency for a given a frequency setting dimension. And here you see all the different, you know, those solid lines are the simulations that I showed you earlier. And these data points are instead are the actual measurements that we, of, of several devices that we fabricated. Uh, and you, as you can see, the very interesting thing, so this is a 100 nanometer gold, 50 nanometer gold, and this one instead is by using a graphene electrode. And as you can see, the graphene case really overlapped perfectly the, that line, that curve 
in which in the simulation we use an electrically conductive boundary. So basically the idea is that we are demonstrating that graphene really acts as a 2D massless conductive boundary for the resonator. So that's the very interesting thing. So it's, it's not causing any shift in the operating frequency of the device. And the last curve that you see here is the case in which we completely remove electrodes and that we haven't done yet, yet from an experimental point of, point of view. But as you can see that these two curves are pretty close to each other. So we really reach an important limit for this technology. But then, of course, it's okay, that is the frequency. What about the electromechanical performance? Well, you know, what we, have, what we measured here, we plot the F time Q product of these resonators for different frequencies, and we compare the graphene device to the reference devices. And as you can see, that for frequencies below, let's say, 500 megahertz, we do not see any significant variation between the graphene device and the reference device. And again, this, uh, we have some statistics, some devices there. Um, but instead, above that frequency, where we believe, and of course that has to be you know, uh, further investigated, it looks like that for frequency above 400 megahertz, where the, uh, the Q of the device is not significantly limited by anchor loss, but actually is limited by electro, elect, um, electro damping, well, by removing that top electron and replacing that with graphene, we start seeing an improvement in performance. Of course, we still have metal on the bottom, so that improvement is not huge, but it seems to be pretty consistent. So that's extremely encouraging, and now we are looking at you know, exploring new ideas in order to even remove that bottom electrode from the device. So, and again, the very interesting thing, again, that I wanna stress out here is that we achieve higher F time Q products, so higher electromechanical performance by reducing the volume of the device. So by reducing the volume, increasing sensitivity, higher performance, so that's extremely interesting. Okay, so what's the time? I still uh, 10 more minutes? Okay, so I'll go pretty quickly. All right, so. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Okay, I'll do 15 minutes maybe. <laughs> All right. All right, so the, the next topic that I want to discuss is the mm, how we can build. Uh, uncooled infrared or possibly terahertz detectors using these piezoelectric uh, micro nanomechanical devices. So what's the idea here? Well, the idea is that the resonant frequency of these devices can be made highly sensitive to temperature. So here we are talking about temperature coefficient of frequencies that depending on the metals that we are using, the thickness that we are employing, in the order from minus 30 to minus 100 ppm per Kelvin. So highly sensitive to temperature, but also, um, the interesting thing is that, as I showed you earlier, these are extremely small devices that are completely released from the substrate, so they're extremely well isolated from the heat sink. So the idea here is that it's a certain amount, even a small amount of infrared power, for example, is absorbed in the resonant body of this device, the temperature of the device will increase substantially because the device is so well isolated from the heat sink, and will also, the temperature will uh, increase quickly because the thermal mass of the device is quite small. And then that temperature variation will translate in a frequency variation because of the temperature coefficient of frequency. And again, taking advantage of the good electromechanical transduction efficiency of this device, we can simply track these the, the, the resonant frequency of the device using a simple oscillator circuit, so relatively low power uh, readout uh, circuit. So that's the basic idea work in principle of how we could use a piezoelectric resonant device as a IR sensor. So what is good about it? So what are the, the important metrics that we could achieve using these uh, uh, resonant technologies? Well, these are the most important uh, metrics uh, for thermal detectors. So of course, the first one is the sensitivity. So what's the frequency shift that we get for a given amount of power? Well, again, we can, uh, we, in this device we have high TCF, so high sensitive, high sensitivity to temperature, but also, as I mentioned, they are very well isolated from the heat sink. So they have a huge, well, they can be made with a huge thermal resistance. So that means that we could potentially achieve sensitivity in the order of tens of ppm per nanowatts of absorbed power. Time constant, of course, it can be relatively low in the order of microsecond to milliseconds, and that is really due to the relatively small thermal mass of the device. And what about the noise performance? Well, as I, you know, still we have a high, relatively high quality factor resonance system, which means that we can build oscillators with a short-term noise stability in the order of part per billion. So then if you look at this high sensitivity, low noise performance, 
you can get noise equivalent power for an infrared detector. So basically the smaller amount of power that you can detect in the order of picowatts per square root of Hertz, which translate in noise equivalent temperature of one, a temperature different, sorry, of one millikelvin. And by the way, these are the very, so this metric is always used, uh, for example, for um, IR cameras, uh, for example. And so these are extremely, you know, better, order of magnitude better than uh, existing micro technology. So the idea of using uh, uh, piezoelectric resonators for, uh, to build IR sensors was uh, first <coughs> introduced by uh, John Digg in 1996, where basically he showed that, well, okay, if we take a quartz resonator, somehow we scale it down, we make it smaller, uh, operating between 200 megahertz and one gigahertz, we could potentially, and we look at the noise performance, we could potentially build uncooled IR imaging systems with a noise equivalent temperature difference smaller than 10 millikelvin. So that was extremely exciting. It was a you know, theoretical paper, but it actually showed the potential of using a piezoelectric micromechanical resonator to build IR sensors. So the first demonstration of a quartz micro resonator uh, used for IR sensor was a few years later in 2011, um, Srinivas uh, from Penn State. Actually, it put a lot, they, put the, 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 they put a lot of effort in basically pinning down these uh, quartz subset, and they build, uh, if I'm not wrong, yes, a device thickness of five, four micron, so an alumin, uh, four micron thick quartz resonator. Um, and basically what they demonstrated, so going through this quite complex fabrication process, they actually demonstrated by thinning down the quartz resonator, they, in taking advantage of the high TCF, so they chose a crystal cut with a large temperature coefficient of frequency of about 92 ppm per Kelvin, so by thinning it down and you know, using micro-machining techniques, they demonstrated that they could achieve a relatively large thermal resistance, right? So, they, so the device is suspended, is isolated from the heat sink, so we are in the order of 10 to 3 Kelvin per watt, and also relatively small thermal capacitance. And they, were, they, they, demonst, you know, they took advantage of the high quality factor of quartz, which is not like the conventional bulk uh, quartz crystal resonators. We are still talking about a quality factor of about 4,000 or so. But still, you know, pretty good uh, noise uh, frequency stability for uh, the device that they built. And they showed noise equivalent power in the order of 3.9 nanowatts per square root of Earth. So extremely exciting uh, results, really. Um, again, as I mentioned before, one uh, challenge that we have with coarse micro resonators is that you see the fabrication process is really challenging. And when we think about building large arrays of devices to build, for example, an IR camera, that starts becoming a real challenge because you really need to have a good uniformity across the wa wafer, and that's, it's quite challenging using, uh, using quartz. So then uh, people start <coughs> thinking, why don't we use a thin, thin piezoelectric materials to build these IR sensors? And one demonstration is, uh, was given by uh, Mina Raizade from University of Michigan, and it's a very recent paper, actually, uh, last year, uh, where basically, <coughs> They use a gallium nitride, so they are developing uh, this gallium nitride resonator technology for different kind of applications, and they try to extend this technology also to, uh, to IR sensing. So the, this gallium nitride is not deposited, so it's not a low temperature process, uh, but it's grown uh, by MOCVD on a silicon on insulated substrate. Uh, so they actually demonstrated that, you know, they build a device thickness of about one micron, so it's a relatively smaller device, so again, they were able to miniaturize further compared to quartz device. And they demonstrated the uh, uh, noise equivalent power in the order of about uh, 126 to one microwatts per square root of Hertz. So again, pretty encouraging performance. Uh, of course, the challenge here with the uh, gallium nitride is that it cannot really deposit on any uh, substrate. It's not a relatively temp low temperature process. So there are some challenges also in that sense in terms of cost and fabrication processes. Um, so what we did instead, you know, we took advantage of our expertise in aluminum nitride, and we built these uh, aluminum nitride nanoplate resonant thermal detectors. Uh, so, and the idea here is that, again, we can exploit the fact that we can deposit this ultra-thin film aluminum nitride using a, a low temperature sputtering process. And so we can really think about scaling these devices in terms of volumes, area, and build very high performance devices. And as I'll show you in the next slides, we really achieve excellent performance in terms of noise equivalent power. We pushed it down to 371 picowatts per square root of Hertz, which is a, a really encouraging and promising. It's pretty much state of the art 
uh, comparable to the state-of-the-art micro-bolometers. So, but let me tell you a little bit about the design, how we build that device. So again, when we think about building a resonant thermal detector, uh, we, the thing that we need to look at is the noise equivalent power, which is again proportional to the noise, inversely proportional to the responsivity. So when we look at the noise for an IR detector, we really need to also consider all the thermal fluctuations kind of noise. So we have thermal fluctuation noise uh, due to the fact that we have a thermal resistance, the device is not, uh, it's actually isolated from the substrate, but also we have a radiation, uh, you know, noise due to the uh, radiation exchange with the environment. Well, if you look at all these quantities, you see that the most important uh, thing here that you want to achieve in order to achieve high performance is that you want to get high absorption coefficient, this beta. So you want to make sure that the IR radiation is effectively absorbed in such a thin film resonant device. It's a big challenge. High responsivity, of course, and also high quality factor. So again, those are the important things that we, you want to achieve. So how we, did we proceed? So how do we, we chose, uh, we, we didn't needed to improve the thermal resistance of the device. So if you look at the, the design, the simple representation of this device, you see that the thermal resistance is substantially set by these two metal anchors, uh, sorry, these two uh, anchors, basically, right? So the heat can flow uh, to the subset, so the subset here and there, right? Can flow to the subset going through these two anchors substantially. So really the thermal resistance associated with these two anchors is dominating the isolation of the device. And you see here the very simple expression for the thermal resistance, <coughs> one over the thermal conductance times the length of the anchor divided by the cross section of the anchor. So the, of course the first thing that we understood is that in order to achieve maximum thermal resistance, we really need to scale you know, the cross section, increase the thermal resistivity of those anchors. But also the interesting thing is that if we somehow can scale the, thermal, the, the cross section of these anchors, possibly we could uh, improve the confinement of the acoustic energy in the resonant body of the device. So we could eliminate that part of Q de degradation due to the loss to the anchors substantially. So by creating a large acoustic mismatch between the resonator and the anchor. So, but then how do we scale the anchor of the device? So that's, that's the challenge. And well, first of all, we realize that we are really limited by the fact that we do need to put metal on those anchors in order to route the signal here on the IDT of the device. So what we decided to do is that, why don't we completely remove the piezoelectric aluminum nitride layer from the anchor, and we anchor the device using a very thin metal layer. So that's what we did, and that's really the ultimate scaling that you can achieve for the anchors, because you are limited by the fact that you wanna still maintain a relatively low resistance electrical connection uh, with the device. So we went, we moved forward and we designed these fully metallic uh, nanoscale anchors with minimum cross section. So that's uh, what we did. But also the very interesting thing that we, we thought is that, okay, so we are in increasing a lot the thermal resistance of the device, but then if you do that, well, of course, the thermal time constant will be, um, will be much slower. And that, of course, makes sense. The only thing that we can do in order to maintain a relatively low thermal time constant, again, is to reduce the thermal capacitance of the device which substantially means scaling the thickness of the plate. So for a micromechanical resonator, we cannot just take the device and let's say make it smaller, smaller area. Because if we do that, the equivalent electrical capacitance will become extremely small. And that would be a challenge for testing, right? So all those advantages that we have in terms of efficient electromechanical transduction will be lost if the equivalent electrical capacitance of the device becomes smaller than parasitics, for example, that you have on the substrate. So we really need to maintain a certain value of capacitance. And in order to do that and scale the area of the device, we really need to reduce the thickness. So again, here I wanna stress out the fact that we really need to achieve this nanoplate kind of structure in order to enable all these performances. So, and that's what we did. So we developed this fabrication process and that's the idea of the device that we wanna build, right? So here we have this interdigital electrode on the bottom that, uh, and the aluminum nitride nanoplate here. And the device uh, is anchored to the subject only these two tiny platinum anchors. So we developed this process, and again, it's a relatively simple four mask uh, microfabrication process. And you can see all the steps here, very similar to what I showed you earlier. And that's what we fabricated. So here you see the device. Uh, so this is the aluminum nitride uh, nanoplate. In this case, it's 450 nanometer. Uh, the anchor is only three micron wide, and uh, if I'm not wrong, it's 20 micron long but the thickness of the anchor is only under nanometer. 
So that's, it's quite interesting because uh, you know, the aluminum nitride nanoplate is 450 nanometer, but only 100 nanometer anchors. So these very uh, tiny anchors are supporting the device. Well, and the first thing that we did is that, well, let's test the electromechanical performance. And you know, again, we look at the, so these are 136 megahertz device. And again, we look at it and electromechanical performance were pretty good actually. And quality factor, mechanical quality factor of about 3000, electromechanical coupling coefficient 1.86%. So really interesting, and you know we st we did some relatively uh, small, you know, simple statistic on relatively small number of samples here. We have only 17 devices fabricated with this process, but we looking at that we realized that we had an average Q improvement at that you know in that frequency range. So here we are going 136 to 122 megahertz of about 28 percent. So this is not conclusive, of course, but still shows that at least by using platinum these platinum anchors, we do not. Uh, degrade the electromechanical performance of the device, but actually we are partially improving the electromechanical performance because we are probably reducing the loss due to the part of loss due to the anchor, the, the energy through the anchors. Okay, so we tested these devices, uh, so we, we characterized the thermal resistance of this device, and as you can see, this is in the order of 5.5, 10 to the 5 Kelvin per watt, so two order of magnitude larger than the other electromechanical resonators that I showed you earlier. So that's an extremely large sensitivity, temperature coefficient of frequency 10, 27 ppm per Kelvin. And then we test this device with a, an IR uh, source. And as you can see, this is the response of the device, which translated by looking at the noise performance. Again, we were able to connect this. Uh, this actually was the first time an electromechanical resonator was connected in a feedback loop on an oscillator and used as an IR sensor. And again, we were able to do that because of the excellent electromechanical performance. And as you can see, we, we achieved a noise equivalent power in the order of uh, 371 picowatts per square root of Earth. And here you see a list of all the performance of this device. So we are, most important things that we got is an NEP371, which corresponds to a best NETD of 273 millikelvin, which is really comparable to the state of the art miniaturized uncooled IR, di uncooled IR detectors. So of course there's still a large margin of improvement, but this is really promising because it means that with this aluminum nitride platform, we can potentially really build high performance uncooled IR detectors. Now the very last thing I wanna discuss very briefly is that, well, I built, I show you how we can build this excellent you know, high thermal resistance resonant device. So excellent thermal detection capabilities but I didn't tell you how do we absorb the IR power in such a thin, thin device. So here I show you like a 500 nanometer aluminum nitride device, how do we absorb IR power there? So in the example that I showed you earlier, in fact, we do not absorb much. So the absorption was in the order of 2% or something like that, just due to the loss of the material. But that is a big challenge because typically people use, uh, there are of course absorbing materials that they can be placed on top of the resonator but the challenge when you have a resonant system, especially such a thin resonant system, again, is that you need to maintain electromechanical performance. You don't wanna uh, increase the thermal mass. You don't wanna degrade the quality factor. So the approach that we have been uh, following, our idea basically is that why don't we actually engineer the device itself in such a way it can absorb specific uh, wavelengths in the IR or terahertz band. And we did that by using concepts that have been developed in the photonic metamaterial community, where basically people have shown that uh, by patterning a top and bottom electrode across, um, so on top and the bottom of a, an, um, a dielectric substantially, it is possible to achieve even, per, you know, what they say perfect absorption, so absorption approaching one. And the idea is basically using plasmonic resonances. So by building uh, um, on, the to on top of the device uh, resonant uh, structures, that can basically minimize the reflection of the electromagnetic wave. And by taking advantage of the fact that there is a bottom electrode also, the transmission is minimized. So the, the absorption is maximized. So that's our idea. And potentially we could, uh, uh, by you know, properly engineering the device, so our idea is to build a piezoelectric resonant metamaterial substantially. So we wanna build a metamaterial, so an extremely thin absorber, but at the same time, we wanna combine these plasmonic resonances with electromechanical resonances and build these uh, high performance devices. Um, and we could potentially uh, cover a very large frequency uh, spectrum. We could design this device to absorb in the mid IR range, but also in the terahertz range, so for much longer wavelengths. And it really depends on the, 
way we pattern these metal uh, layers. And you know why this is so interesting? Well, especially if you think about in the IR or terahertz for spectroscopy applications, right? I mean, the idea here that we have, we could build a sort of um, multicolor detector arrays that work at room temperature with extremely high uh, uh, sensitivity and detection capabilities that could be used for, to build extremely fast uh, spectrometers, for example, uh, that can be used, uh, and relatively compact spectrometers that can be used for an in-field kind of operation. And of course, it has advantages compared to other technologies from that point of view. So that's what we did. Uh, basically, the idea is that, okay, let's see if we can, first thing that we do is, uh, let's see if we can build these uh, piezoelectric metamaterial that can work as a good absorber in the mid-IR range, for example. And that's what we did. So we came up, uh, we came up with this uh, design. So here uh, we have a piezoelectric layer, 500 nanometer thick, with a bottom electrode of about 100 nanometer. So in this particular example, the bottom is a just metal plate. And on top, we build these uh, plasmonic nanostructures. So here you see the dimension uh, in this direction is 1.7 micron. The separation between this gold uh, uh, plasmonic nanostructure is only 360 nanometers. And by changing basically these two dimensions, these A and B, we can basically achieve different values. We can basically tune the operating uh, absorb the, the frequency of absorption for this structure. But, so basically what you can see that you can get 80% absorption in such a thin film aluminum nitride. So that's extremely interesting because now you have this piezoelectric metamaterial, which is a pretty good absorber, spectrally selective absorber, but we still have the piezoelectric property. So we can actually build a micromechanical resonator using this new properly engineered material. And that's what we did. So this is extremely recent. We will uh, uh, present this at the MEMS conference in uh, you know, coming January, February, I remember. So that's the idea. Basically, uh, we, we build this device. Again, we have this platinum anchor, the same concept that I, I ex explained to you earlier. Uh, and we patterned you know, this plasmonic metasurface on top of the device. We, we cannot really cover the entire device with this plasmonic metasurface, otherwise we will not have good confinement of the electric field and achieve good electromechanical coupling. But so we optimized the design in such a way we could achieve good electromechanical performance, but also here you can see a pretty large absorption. We have an absorption peak of about 60% at 8.8 .8 micron. So this is extremely interesting because for the first time we're really showing that we can couple this plasmonic resonance with electromechanical resonances to build a device that can detect uh, in a selective way infrared radiation. So we tested this device with a phantom cascade laser uh, at, you know, just to show basically just as a heat source basically. And uh, using a chopper we uh, basically measured what's the cutoff frequency uh, the, and extracted the thermal time constant, which is in the order of 440 microseconds. So it's a pretty fast uh, detector, thermal detector, again, because the device is r r relatively small. And then we used uh, uh, a globar, uh, so the emission range is the 2 to 16 micron. So again, our resonant peak is at 8 micron, right? But we use this relatively broadband source in order to, uh, to, to characterize the response of infrared to our device, and we compare to the one of device without uh, plasmonic structure, so not optimized for absorption. And despite the fact that we use a broadband source, because that's the only thing that we have available in our lab right now, we don't have a eight micron QCL yet. We were able to show that you know there is an obvious uh, significant improvement in detection capability, even for a broadband uh, source compared to a device that is not engineered using a metamaterial. And as you can see here, what I'm showing is the noise equivalent power. So in this case, for this specific device and this noise equivalent power includes the absorption substantially. So this is really the power, the noise equivalent power delivered on the device that we can detect. And as you can see, this is the noise uh, limit. So basically if we plot those curves due to noise fluctuations, thermomechanical fluctuation, so they are like this. Uh, so there is a gap here. Uh, so there is still margin of improvement. We, we still need to figure out uh, what are the other noise, source, noise sources that are affecting the performance of the device. For example, it's the one over F noise of the resonator itself, which is uh, really something that we are trying to understand better uh, and trying to figure out how we can mitigate that noise source. We believe that one possibility could be by removing the electrodes, as I showed you earlier with the graphene. By removing that, we should probably reduce the no one over F noise. But if we can reach this noise limit, really, the, we have the potential to you know, get noise equivalent power in the order of picowatts per square root of Hertz 
and uh, noise equivalent temperature difference in the order of one millikelvin. So we can really build these uh, uh, spectrally selective multicolor detector arrays using this technology. And given the time, I think I will not be, not be able to go through the uh, magnetic field sensor. How, how much time there? It's over. Yes, I can finish it very, very quickly, like a few slides. Let me do that. So the last thing I want to show is about this, uh, how we can build magnetic field sensor using these piezoelectric resonant devices. Well, the first thing is that, well, a piezoelectric resonator is not sensitive to magnetic field. So somehow we need to find a way to make it sensitive. And the approach that we have been following in collaboration with a colleague of mine at Northeastern University, who is a, um, a Professor Nyansan, who is an expert in the area of magnetic materials and magnetic devices, uh, the, the, the approach that we have been following is that let's build a, a multiferroic resonant device. So basically, let's combine a piezoelectric material with a magnetostrictive material. And by doing that, we can build a resonator whose Young's modulus is extremely sensitive to magnetic field. So that's the basic idea. Of course, there are challenges there, because again, we want to build a good resonator, so good electromechanical performance. So, but that's what we did. And as you can see here, again, we take advantage of the uh, scaling capabilities of aluminum nitride, so we can use a relatively thin uh, magnetostrictive material that is also deposited with a low temperature sputtering process. This material is iron gallium boron, so we have 250 nanometer magnetostrictive material, 250 nanometer piezoelectric material. And so we build the device, we characterize the performance, and as you can see again, you see that these numbers are pretty much the same because that's our goal, right? We always want to be in that range substantially with a KT square Q product larger than 10 substantially. And as you can see, you know, we get this good electromechanical performance in air uh, for these devices. So we, can, we maintain the electromechanical coupling coefficient. The interesting thing is that the magnetostrictive material itself is actually, con you know, it's a sort of a conductor. It is a conductor. So basically we are using these uh, as a magnetic sensing layer, but also as top floating electrode for the resonator. So it really um, fits the purpose for, for this particular device. So we do not lose any electromechanical coupling. We don't really need to add much on top of the resonator. We actually use this um, magnetoelectric, uh, mag uh, magnetostrictive material to build the resonant, the body of the device itself. And then we tested uh, this resonator for different values of uh, magnetic field. Uh, and as you can see here, what I'm plotting is the resonant frequency of the device uh, for magnetic field from minus 200 to plus 200 Oster, uh, applied along the width in this direction, and here you see uh, the different values, and along the length of the device. So this is the length, this is the width, substantially. And uh, so during the deposition of the uh, magnetic field, the magnetic film, sorry, the iron gallium boron, we introduced the magnetic anisotropy in the length direction. So the EC axis of the magnetic film is in this direction. So basically when we apply the magnetic field in the uh, opposite direction, we have a rotation of the um, uh, magnetic uh, domains. And as you can see, the operating frequency of the device changes, and that is due to the delta E effect, the variation of the Young's modulus of the magnetostrictive material. So and there, our resonator follows that extremely well, substantially, so the resonant frequency really depends on the Young's modulus. And we reach a minimum value here, which can, uh, of 100 oyster that basically cancels the uh, anisotropy field that we introduced, and finally it saturates for larger magnetic field. When we apply along the length, is, the behavior of course is different because we have the uh, magnetic moment, uh, sorry, the magnetic uh, uh, the domains are already aligned in this direction, so it quickly reaches the saturation. Okay, so that's very interesting, but what's the application? So the device works well. You know, basically we have a resonant device with magnetic, uh, with, with frequencies extremely sensitive to magnetic field, so we build a pretty high performance magneto um, multiferroic MEMS resonator. But then if we test this uh, for uh, small values of a magnetic field, we see that we were able to achieve a detection limit of the order of 300 picotesla. So this is a quite impressive because it's a, it's a small device. We are working at room temperature uh, in an unshielded environment. And in this case, we are applying a magnetic bias of five oysters. Basically, the idea is that we want to uh, be in a region in which we have a large sensitivity. But even if we remove that magnetic bias, we actually get a, a detection limit of the order of 600 picotesla. 
So this is extremely promising for uh, several applications. And in particular, as you can see, if you compare with other technologies, we really have the advantage that now we can build magnetic field sensors with higher detection capabilities, but are also extremely small. So for example, now we are starting a new project in which we are uh, planning on uh, integrating these uh, um, uh, miniaturized magnetic field sensors in uh, neuroprobes to uh, do some uh, brain imaging uh, using uh, these magnetic field sensors. Also, the last thing that we did uh, is that, again, we, we build uh, basically an oscillator based on these uh, multiferroic magnetic field sensors. And we showed that we, by taking advantage of the intrinsic anisotropy, anisotropy of, these, uh, our, of the response of the device, we can build extremely nice compasses. So here you see it's a resonant device. So that we can track the frequency of the resonator and we can basically detect the angle of the magnetic field with a very high resolution of 0.3 degree. So I will definitely skip the conclusions and let me just acknowledge uh, my students, collaborators, and the funding uh, sources. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.